Good morning, guys. We have right now about 81 people that have logged in. I know some more people will be tuning in. We usually <clears throat> give it a couple of minutes to let everybody chime in. But unfortunately, today we're going to have to cut this webinar about 10 minutes short just because we have back to back webinars today. So um, I wanted to go ahead on and introduce. First of all, thank you guys again for tuning in um, for being so faithful um, to tune in to our monthly webinars. We I greatly appreciate um, without you guys. These webinars would not be a success. So thank you so much. I do want to go ahead on and um, let you guys know. Um, you pretty much know the drill. I'm going to drop, if you guys are needing any PDH credits, then I'll be dropping that um, survey in the chat. Um, so you can fill that out, copy and paste it into your browser. That's how you get the credit. So I'll be dropping that in around 1130 or so. And um, 1130, 1140. Um, so without further ado, I want to go ahead on and introduce um, Francis and Laurel. And from there, um, Fran, you can take the floor. Um, so... Right now we have Professor Francis Digiano. He served on the faculty of the Department of Civil and Environment Engineering at UMass for 12 years before joining the Department of Environmental Sciences and Engineering at UNC Chapel Hill, where he served for 26 years. His specialty is water quality, water quality treatment. He found at Clean Jordan Lake in 2009, soon after his retirement with the mission of removing trash and preventing its recurrence. So far, 8,500 volunteers have removed 19,000 bags of trash and 4,800 tires. Thank you so much, Professor Fran, for taking your time out today and helping us with this webinar. Next, I would like to introduce Laurel Quinock. Um, she is the GIS Administrator in the Office of the University of Architect at NC State University. She manages enterprise GIS systems, data and mapping for the facilities division. She has a background in water resources engineering, which led her to the field of GIS. Thank you so much for Laurel for taking out your time today to assist us. And without further ado, Fran, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. And, and again, my thanks to everyone for joining in. Um, I've lived in North Carolina since 1981, uh, and um, you know Jordan Lake has been in my backyard, uh, so to speak. So um, I'm very familiar with it because I'm an outdoor person. And I've kayaked and a lot on the lake, uh, just about the whole reach of the lake, and uh, cycled around it and sailed on it, and just have made the both best use of it. I, I hope some of you also have been out there. To have a look at uh, this great resource, um, what um, uh, what what I'd like to do today is to talk about perhaps an interesting twist on on stormwater for you all, and that is um, its impact on the shoreline of a of a large lake, and what we can do to reduce the the loading of trash uh, for the future. Um, the way uh, we plan to do this is that um, I will talk about the mission and accomplishments uh, of Clean Jordan Lake and um, then tell you about the North Carolina State University uh, Geospatial Information Science and Technology Master's Program. That's the MGIST capstone projects and how we've uh, taken advantage of this to apply GIS to characterize uh, this I call it the nexus uh, between stormwater and trash. We'll get into that um, a little bit. And then Laurel will take over be, uh, to talk about the the details of what we were able to accomplish with uh, the uh, NC uh, program uh, there on the capstone projects. And th that will include a phone map that she's created and the GIS trash mapping tools that you can all view at the Jordan Lake, Clean Jordan Lake website. So a bit of background, uh, Michelle mentioned, uh, I did find a found, I was the founder of Clean Jordan Lake in 2009 as a nonprofit. Uh, our mission is to remove trash from the shoreline to restore natural habitats and beauty uh, and promote uh, more effective trash prevention programs in watershed counties. And that's the critical part of really what this GIS mapping of stormwater will do. Um, just looking here, this is a great view of the lake um, from the southern end. And you're, you're looking back uh, 
On the right side is the New Hope uh, River Channel coming in the direction of Durham and Hillsborough. And on the left, you see another um, outlet uh, inlet uh, here, which is the Haw River Arm coming down from Greensboro. These two meet and the dam uh, is down here at the very end of the lake. Now, when we take a look at the lake as a whole, the watershed of the lake is, is huge, 1,700 square miles. Uh, the lake is, is down here at the very uh, bottom here at the south end, and uh, the Haw River flow, uh, of course, is collecting water from all these streams and transporting it primarily by the Haw River uh, into the lake. And then from the Hillsborough Durham direction, we have New Hope Creek uh, coming in uh, to join, uh, as I said, with uh, with the Haw River arm at the bottom. So together, uh, there are um, 800,000 people, roughly, living in this watershed, 6,000 miles of highway. Um, the, uh, the lake length uh, is about 180 miles of shoreline. And what people probably don't realize is that when we talk about trash on the shoreline, um, most of that is from stormwater. We estimate about 80% is from stormwater and then only 20% from recreation. Although the 20% from recreation is right in your face, so to speak, because it's exactly where you go, uh, perhaps on the lake to launch a, a boat or have a picnic um, and uh, things like our activities that promote, uh, that, that cause trash, but 80% of the load is really coming from stormwater. And uh, as Michelle mentioned, uh, we have done uh, quite a lot of work in, uh, since 2009, uh, repeated cleanups uh, at many sites. Um, this uh, photo just illustrates uh, the intensity of it. Uh, this is a cleanup being done on a, perhaps a half a mile of shoreline uh, in the early years of our work and where we were collecting a legacy of trash um, that had accumulated since the lake was created in 1981 to when we started work in 2009. So we had, uh, we were behind the eight ball uh, and 28, 29 years of trash had accumulated. Um, so um, we were collecting uh, huge amounts early in our work. And we're, as, as Michelle mentioned, actually our stats have gone up a little bit even since uh, I reported to her what, what we've accomplished. So we're at 9,000 plus volunteers now and 700 cleanups uh, and, uh, and around four, uh, 200 tons of trash, 30 miles of shoreline have been cleaned uh, multiple times. And we say that because this is the issue, stormwater. Uh, if we take this ex uh, couple of dramatic examples um, of the profile uh, of, of uh, the uh, cumulative precipitation over short periods of time, this being, of course, Hurricane Florence in September of 2018, but then we had other storms along the way to February, so we had, um, we had an enormous amount of rain, over 25 inches of rain cumulatively in um, in these, uh, what is this? One, two, three, four, five months. And you see the profile uh, of the elevation of the lake, uh, which the normal elevation is 216 above sea level. And of course, uh, Hurricane uh, Florence, uh, an enormous increase in the elevation of the lake, uh, over 15 feet, uh, 16, 17 feet, rise in lake and then it, it declined, but then we had more rain and so it bumped up again. And then it we had another storm and it went up again. And each time this happens, when I see these profiles, I think of them as trash profiles because that's what's bringing in trash, the flushing of the watershed. And here's another example, uh, less dramatic, with only six inches of rain cumulatively. We did have a, a winter storm viola in February of 2021, and you see the response is this very high, this rise in lake level for extended periods of time, days, and then going down. Uh, and so we know that following this, we're going to have trash. Um, the 
trash mapping that we do by uh, geographic information system is is has evolved because of the NC State uh, program that we're connected with, the Master of Geospatial Information Science and Technology, um, where they have a capstone experience and students work with uh, people in the commu a community and industrial partners, um, and this is where they get a chance to test their ability to uh, do GIS that they've learned in their master's program. And uh, we, uh, as Clean Jordan Lake, has had these four partnerships uh, with students uh, where um, it is, in fact, a close working relationship uh, uh, with routine uh, communications by email and in person. Um, the projects that um, we've done started in 2018 and that was the, the first goal there was uh, quite uh, simple, uh, which was importing the cleanup data that we had put on spreadsheets for all of these cleanups. Uh, and, uh, you know, the spreadsheets are pretty involved, but to put them into uh, GIS format was the first thing to do. And then what uh, the first student did uh, was to look at, uh, inspect the, the USGS record of lake elevations that you can find online. Uh, this would be at the Moncure um, North Carolina station uh, to look at the profiles that I showed you a moment ago and estimate uh, that the amount of lake level rise and the number of them. Uh, and then she also did some work um, with uh, plotting the data uh, with GIS mapping and, and our first attempt at uh, dividing the lake shoreline into sections where we could identify uh, trash accumulation. And she did what's called hotspot analysis, which is a technique within GIS to see the correlation of site to site for trash. Uh, in other words, uh, you get sites adjacent, do they correlate with, with uh, the same amounts of trash or, or not? And there can be differences. Um, then uh, we had another student come uh, uh, to uh, look at uh, ad uh, developing a phone app to to allow volunteers to clean put cleanup data in automatically into the GIS database and um, to incorporate the web mapping uh, into web mapping the um, lake level rise information we had previously had. Now Laurel arrived uh, after that and uh, made a huge improvement on the phone app that she'll talk about with you, and also um, made a much more sophisticated approach uh, to estimating the ex extent of lake level rise, how, how many feet above normal did it go, and how many of these events uh, for an automatic detection into the GIS mapping system uh, so that it's not a hand-done uh, process. It's, it's done by connectivity to the USGS database. Uh, and she'll explain that. The last project was uh, diverting our attention away from the shoreline back into the DOT highway trash data system. Um, and there is already some GIS mapping of that going on within DOT. But um, this student uh, developed what's called what he called a trash threat level index uh, to project trash loads from highways within uh, the watershed. As I mentioned, there are 6,000 highways, miles of highway. So um, we're not going to talk about that project today, but highway trash is definitely a, a source of a lot of trash um, that we find at the lake. Um, just how much it is of, as a percentage is unknown to us yet, because that project was done in 2022, and we needed uh, we we we've uh, we've we need another student to come on board uh, to continue that work uh, with us on a capstone project uh, to to handle the data more than we were able to uh, do in this in his project, um, but. With the regard to the mapping that's been done so far, I want to emphasize that where we focused our attention is at the southern end of the lake, and that's because um, the southern end of the lake is really receiving most of the stormwater uh, because the watershed of the Haw River, it, which is influencing the southern end of the lake, 
is 1,400 square miles of the 1,700 square miles um, that are around the lake. So that was the focus. And so when we drill in more closely uh, to look at, here's the Haw River arm coming again. If you remember that photograph I showed you of the lake, we were looking from uh, the very southern end back up into the northern uh, entry of the Hall River arm to the lake, and then from the uh, the north over here down the New Hope Creek, and we we in order to do GIS mapping, we divided these sections of shoreline where we've done cleanups, and we've continued to repeat cleanups after each event, uh, stormwater event. Well, not each and every one, but uh, the ones uh, when we get uh, groups to come out, there have been a certain number of rainfalls that have occurred. Uh, in between uh, pre, uh, the last cleanup and current one that we planned. So that's what these dots are, is the division that we made is pretty intense. Uh, 56 subsections, this covers about well, roughly 30 miles of shoreline in here. Uh, and uh, we've got 56 subsections. Uh, so the idea of that would be um, to, uh, to be able to quantify trash uh, in a spatial sense. Uh, as well as a, a temporal sense, w w which Laurel will talk about. Um, the, uh, the data that, we're, that she's going to mention, and I won't go into a lot of detail because she's going to do that, is that we, we, we have metrics that we develop. Uh, and the very simplest of those would be that uh, we take the number of bags of trash that you collect and divide it uh, and the, uh, by the length of shoreline that you can measure with the GIS mapping. So you produce an intensity of trash per 100 feet. And we use a very simple um, uh, common estimate of 20 pounds of, of, of trash per bag. And we get a trash, bounds of trash per 100 feet. We do the same thing with tires. Uh, we quantify the number of cleanups that have been done. And uh, she's gonna explain about how we look at the, uh, the trash accumulation for each stormwater event by, uh, uh, by looking at the number of stormwater events between successive cleanups at, at, a, at the same subsection. And uh, so the, the end result, we hope, is a metric that relates trash level, lake level rise, or cumulative lake level rise be, when you got multiple trash events, uh, stormwater events. So you produce something like pounds of trash per 100 feet per lake level rise or per storm, if you want to say. And this is just uh, my last slide before I turn it over, is to uh, talk about how we can just uh, collapse all of the detail that Laurel will talk about in terms of identifying spatially where the trash is around the lake shoreline uh, to a, a more global view, which uh, we did by looking at um, the, the work that we were able to do since 2014. And why did we choose 2014? Well, it's, a, it's just our guess, really, at uh, educated guess, where in point in time that we've done a lot of cleanups to, from 2009 to 2014. But most of those cleanups are, we're addressing what we call the legacy trash, the trash that have accumulated since 1981. So we we hope that by 2014 we had you know made a good go of cleaning trash from all that shoreline area over multiple cleanups, at least to get the trash uh, off from the legacy uh, uh, the legacy trash removed. And now we're, we've got sort of a clean slate so to speak, uh, the, a clean shoreline, relatively speaking. And now the, the events that we do for cleanups are really, we're removing trash that had accumulated, you know, since, um, uh, so we're up to date, so to speak, and, the, and we're looking at trash accumulating with rainfall events. So there have been 52 of those lake level rises since uh, uh, this January 1, 2014. And these are the number of bags and tires. And um, what we did was simply take the number of rainfalls, which these lake level rises represent, right? Every time it rains, this is the integrated 
the most reasonable metric to use is the lake level rise since rainfall is always variable within a watershed over it. You know, it can be raining one place and not in another, but the lake level is an integrator of that rainfall. Uh, so that's why we use lake level and uh, we can say then that if we take the pounds and so forth, we, we say 1.2 tons of trash per rainfall and enter the shoreline of the lake. It's a, it's a, it's a quite astounding amount, but um, I believe it, it has validity. We've, we've uh, tried our best to represent it uh, with, uh, with the data, uh, the number of cleanups we've had uh, to show that um, that is a, a pretty good estimate as well as the tires entering. So, um, you know, here we are with this global uh, estimate, which is reasonable uh, for anyone to want to look at, uh, but Laura's going to talk about the details. And I did want to mention um, one thing about uh, our website, because I would encourage you for any reason at all, whether it's GIS related or not, to visit our website. Um, we have lots of valuable information here, and I'll just finish by talking about showing you about how we look at results. And um, this is just to show the um, the results of all cleanups that we've done. And when you do this, you click on this, you'll see come up here a real time indicator of the trash that uh, our cleanup accomplishments. Th these are all real time data that are, are taken extracted from our spreadsheet where we accumulated it all. Uh, and so every time there's a cleanup, this number will go up and the number of volunteers and bags and so forth. Uh, you'll notice that propane canisters are here, by the way, and you might wonder how it is that we could have removed almost 1,100 of these. And it's not because of people doing cooking along the shoreline. It's because night fishermen use these for lanterns and they fish under bridges. And uh, we have groups in our adoption program that go out and remove this huge load that's left uh, by fishermen. Uh, and anyway, there are a lot of um, uh, data here to look at, and I would encourage you uh, to to have uh, you know how to help uh, if you're you know interested in ways to help us. Uh, we have a whole listing here of um, ways to do cleanups uh, and. Um, the that we have uh, opportunities for groups to come out and work with us just for one day and we have opportunities uh, for folks to join uh, what we call our adopt a shoreline program uh, which is down here uh, and uh, the information is 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 shown here at our website about how to adopt a shoreline section uh, and we have 30 about 30 of these adopt a shoreline sections around the lake, adding to um, the efforts of these large groups that come out uh, to help clean up. So with that, um, I'm going to um, hopefully do the right thing here and make Laurel the presenter. And uh, I'm going to say yes, and there you go. All righty. Let me share my screen. Um, screen one, yes. Okay. Can everyone, friend, can you hear me and see my screen and everything? Give me a thumbs up if that's working. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. All right, yeah, thanks everyone for, for um, having us here today in this webinar. Um, as Fran mentioned, I was um, a student in the MGIST program at NC State and worked with Clean Jordan Lake on my um, capstone project. And um, again, you know, there were kind of a series of projects um, prior to mine that looked at um, <clears throat> working with the trash cleanup data. Um, and my project kind of specifically focused on um, sort of mapping and analyzing trash accumulation due to stormwater runoff along the lake. So I'm just gonna kind of provide a quick 
overview of what was involved in my project and then demo a couple of the GIS um, applications that I developed. So, alrighty, um, I'm gonna move this up real quick. So, just a quick project overview. These are kind of the components. Um, these were the components of my capstone project. So I completed mine actually in, let's see, fall of 2020. So it's been, it's been a little while. I had to refresh myself a little bit on what I did. Um, but uh, first of all, I developed a GIS to store existing and future um, cleanup data for Clean Jordan Lake. So, you know, they had an existing database that had all the cleanups to date, but um, the goal was to develop um, an enterprise GIS system where they could continue to um, enter new cleanup events that they collected using the phone application um, and add them to um, add them to the GIS and web mapping that that I developed. So, um, and then, then, of course, since since this project really involved looking at stormwater impacts, um, a big part of of what I what I worked on was developing um, a tool that would identify um, when significant rainfall events occurred, you know, what the duration of those events were, and then used um, that data to kind of compute these trash loading metrics that, that Fran talked about earlier. And I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on, on what those are in the next slide. Um, and then of course, you know, it's a GIS project. So a big part of my job was developing GIS mapping applications. Um, the two key applications I'm gonna to demo today include a data collection tool, which um, allows CGL to enter new cleanups in the field, and then a uh, public facing web mapping application that um, really just allows users to kind of examine, you know, some of the trash cleanup data, and then also look um, some tools and things that allow them to look at the um, stormwater impacts there. Okay, so the trash loading metrics, again, this project involved looking at, at the stormwater impacts, and we did this by um, computing these, these different trash, trash metrics here. So these metrics um, basically estimate the amount of trash that deposits on the shoreline um, each time the lake level rises during what we consider a significant rainfall event. So I, I believe in previous work that um, Fran had done, um, they had defined a significant rainfall event as one in which the lake rises two feet above the normal lake level. So the normal lake level is 216. So when it rises up to 218 and stays up, then that's considered um, what we call lake level rise or significant significant rainfall event here. Um, so what I did was I worked with um, lake level data from the USGS gauge that's located near the Jordan Lake Dam. Um, and what you can see here is kind of an example of, of how these metrics are computed. So if we have a cleanup event at a site here, um, and then a subsequent cleanup event at the same site or subsection here, um, you can see the, the lake level rise, or sorry, the lake level show, plotted here for you know, a period of interest. Um, what we wanna know is how many times um, how many lake level rises we have, and then what's the cumulative lake level rise and feet across all of these, these events that are identified. Um, so for this example, we see there's three lake level rises, and then between those, there's a total of 30, fit, 30 feet of cumulative lake level rise. So um, what I did was I used um, coding, Python programming, um, incorporated that with GIS to develop a tool that would, that essentially kind of, um, extracts the data from a USGS web service, you know, identifies when those events occur, and then computes these trash loading metrics for um, as cleanup events are added to the database. So there's two metrics here. The first one um, looks at the pounds of trash per 100 feet of shoreline cleaned per lake level rise. So, you know, for each event that that's occurred between these subsequent cleanups. And then the second one is the pounds of trash per 100 feet of shoreline per foot of cumulative lake level rise. So per foot of um, this value here. So hopefully um, you know, that kind of explains what we mean when we were talking about trash loading metrics. Alrighty, so I just kind of wanted to do a couple of demos of the applications I developed. I mentioned that the first one was a um, a data collection tool. So if any of you are, you know, familiar with GIS, you've probably heard of Esri. Esri is the leading kind of software company um, <clears throat> creating GIS software. 
and um, Collector is it's called Collector for ArcGIS is an application that's designed to allow for for field data collection, um, and it, it j basically just incorporates a web map and allows um, allows for field data collection to be entered. So I'm going to just play a quick video here, and the video is going to kind of show um, how this particular application works and how CGL volunteers or staff can use it to enter a new cleanup a path, cleanup event path in the field. So hopefully this will pay well, play well. So this is just my mobile phone that I recorded here. So the map opens up and it kind of defaults to um, the clean Jordan Lake area. So if we want to add a, um, add a cleanup event for a particular site, you select the site. Um, and then you will start to enter the path. Now, <laughs> when I recorded this video, I was at home in my house, so the GPS is automatically going to navigate to where your current location is. But ideally, um, the person that would be entering the new cleanup event would be in the field, or you know, you just have to kind of navigate back to where you want to um, delineate the area. So what we're doing here is just drawing or delineating, um, you know, the length of shoreline that is clean for this particular event. So I'm just kind of sketching out a an example here. Um, <clears throat> but ideally someone would maybe be walking along the shoreline there and capturing the area that's cleaned. And then you enter the, um, data for that particular cleanup event. So it's the date of cleanup, um, the bags collected, the pounds of trash collected, the number of tires, um, the number of volunteers and the hours, and then any notes, um, that, that need to be entered for that cleanup. And then the organization that's, that's doing the cleanup event. Um, and then once that that new cleanup path is entered, it is automatically included in the database, and then the trash metrics can be computed um, for that cleanup event. So everything, all of the web mapping applications I developed would automatically include that new um, cleanup event once it's entered in the field with the collector application. Okay, so um, this um, next demo I'm going to do is of the kind of public facing web mapping application that I developed for Clean Jordan Lake. So this is linked on the website as well that uh, Fran just showed you earlier. Um, probably all of you are familiar with with similar applications being in the stormwater field. You probably used, um, used some of these before. So um, essentially I'll just kind of point out some of the some of the features here on this web map. Um, first of all, there's, there's an about widget that that automatically pops up and it includes some background information on, uh, CGL and also some details on how to use this, this application in terms of the buttons and things. And there's a link here to a user guide that I created that also kind of goes into more detail about how to use some of the tools included with the web map. Um, <clears throat> this button down here brings up the attribute data. Um, so the attribute data. Is, is all of the data or information that's associated with all the features on the map. So it's basically a, a database table here. So here we're looking at the cleanup event paths. You can see all of the, um, we have about, let's see, 241 cleanup events that have been entered in the database. And it includes, um, you know, some of the, the information that we were just entering. Now they, these are sorted from the, um, earliest cleanup events. So some of these, you know, don't have all of the data populated, but if you scroll down to some of the more recent events, you'll see here that um, they're capturing, or the lake level rises that I talked about, the cumulative lake level rise is being computed, and then these trash loading metrics um, are being computed over here, both for, you know, the pounds of trash, the bags of trash, and then also the number of tires. Um, so again, if someone's, you know, working in the field and adding a new cleanup event, this will automatically, automatically, you know, be populated this table and the map. And then these metrics can be computed um, using kind of a separate, separate tool that it, I developed for just the CGL administrators to, to do. So, <clears throat> um, one of the features I really like um, is if you click on one of these sites or the subsections, the pop-up that displays kind of gives a good summary of all of the cleanups that have that have occurred at that site. So this is also automatically updated if a new cleanup event is entered. It's going to automatically, you know, update this number here and tell you when the last cleanup event occurred. So this one was done pretty recently. Um, and then it just gives you a sense for kind of the magnitude of of the trash that's been collected in some of these areas. So just interesting to look around and and 
and see kind of some of um, some of the data for these specific points. Um, this tool here uh, allows you to plot trash metrics for a given site. Um, so what you can do is select a specific site or subsection here. So I will select HRAE2. And what it shows, let me see if I can expand this a little bit. So what it shows here, um, it shows these different trash loading metrics for each cleanup event that have been done, have been completed at this site since, you know, all of the events. So this one has had, you know, a lot of different cleanups dating back to 2010. Um, so this metric is just showing the pounds of trash per 100 feet of shoreline cleaned. Um, <clears throat> if you scroll down, you can look at the other two trash metrics that I mentioned earlier and described. So this one is looking at the pounds of trash per 100 feet of shoreline cleaned per, per lake level rise, so per significant rainfall event here. And then the final one is um, showing a plot of the pounds of trash per 100 feet of shoreline per cumulative per foot of cumulative lake level rise here. So it kind of gives you a good way to view, um, you know, maybe how these trash loading metrics have varied over time. And then if you want to look at, you know, a specific event, it's an easy way to kind of um, view that here. So it's a nice tool. Um, this tool is the average trash metric tool. So what it does is it computes and shows the um, average amount of trash that, acu that accumulates per site. So we can select a specific metric here to look at. Um, again, this has the pounds of trash per 100 feet of shoreline, or we can choose one of these metrics that really focuses a little bit more on the stormwater impact. So I'll just go ahead and run it for the pounds of trash per 100 feet of shoreline per lake level rise. And I'm going to open up. Let's see. Turn that off. Okay, and so what you see here with the output, um, <clears throat> so each point here kind of represents a cleanup site or subsection, and then the size of the point sort of represents the magnitude of trash that accumulates on average um, for each significant rainfall event at that site. So it gives you a little bit of a of um, an indicator of the kind of the spatial variability along the shoreline with where you know where trash accumulation. Um, on average is the worst. Um, so that's kind of, you know, another, another interesting tool to look at. Um, and then we have some other kind of common, you know, web mapping tools here. You can change the base map if you want to look at, uh, let's see, I want to turn on the topographic base map here and the legend and um, a layer list, which, which kind of shows, um, gives you access to turn layers on and off if you'd like. So, so that is the, the public facing web mapping application. I'm going to go back to the presentation here. So let's see. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, kind of describe the impact of this work, you know, really my project, I think, and the tools I developed gave CGL sort of an expanded tool set, not just to, um, you know, to look at existing data, but to sort of maintain and analyze trash cleanup data um, moving forward, including the, um, with the collector app, you know, they, they're able now to um, collect data for, for future events in the field and include that in their database. And I think, um, you know, having the collector app really gave them an opportunity to improve the data quality a little bit there. Um, the web mapping application, you know, kind of gives users, um, both public users and CGL, uh, you know, administrators, different ways to analyze and visualize trash accumulation. Um, and then the trash metrics themselves, I think, you know, as, as Fran has talked about, really kind of reveal um, what some of the stormwater impacts are, give us some good indicators, um, you know, to how kind of the magnitude of, of um, stormwater impacts on, on the trash issues there. And so I think that that can help with both, you know, targeting future cleanups and then just raising, you know, general education and awareness as we are, as we are doing here. So, and I think that's all I have. Um, before I finish, I do want to say, you know, I know you all are um, working in the stormwater field and, and, um, 
you know, probably professionals working there, I encourage you if, if this, um, if you're interested in GIS or using GIS, I encourage you to look into the capstone project with the MGIST. It's a really great program. It was definitely part of um, the master's program that I enjoyed the most because it was great to work with, you know, a real life scenario and develop something that's still being used today. So I encourage you to, to look into that and um, you can, you can contact um, the Center for Geospatial Analytics at NC State, if that sounds like something that might be, you know, something you'd want to get involved in a project with a student. So, and that's all I have. Um, if y'all have any questions, I'm sure Fran and I would be happy to answer them. I'm going to okay. go uh, stop sharing my screen, I think, right? Yeah. I all do right. have several questions for you guys. Yeah. And, um, so I'll just start with the first one. One, um, Katie wants to know if there's a push to reduce the amount of waste generated in the watershed to see if that impacts the amount of trash that reaches Jordan Lake, rather than just cleaning up what eventually reaches the lake. <laughs> oh, that's the, I don't know what you'd call in today's uh, uh, financial world, but it, it, that's the, I'll call it the $2 million question or something. <laughs> um, yeah, um, that's the whole thing. Uh, trash prevention is where it starts, and we look at the sources, which range from, believe it or not, um, uh, parks um, generate trash. Uh, we find, uh, we used to joke about the fact that the number of basketballs that we found it, it would be uh, would be enough to supply all the high school basketball uh, teams with the basketball in, in North Carolina. It, it's amazing uh, that we find such things, softballs, baseballs, and all that. That's a, a, far, a fairly uh, innocuous uh, type of trash, but still it's there. Uh, but yes, um, the trash uh, on roadsides, I believe, is something that is, is, hand, is something we can handle through trash prevention. That's really um, we could intercept the trash there, um, which is not the same as what your question is about just simply not letting it happen, which is great, is, a, is involved with, uh, in the case of uh, truck uh, transport, uh, you know, covering loads more carefully. Uh, there, there are measures, I guess where I come down on it is that, you know, coming back to the counties level of government, and there are eight counties, and uh, if they could promote um, certain messages, um, not just with citizens about what they do, like the leaving the basketball at the at the local park, uh, but um, uh, just uh, looking at uh, what they could do to send this message forward. Uh, as I said, the interception of of trash. Uh, well, it's a little bit easier if you get closer to the source, and in, in in the sense of it's it's a dual benefit. If you clean the trash from highways, for example, the highways look, you beautify the landscape at the same time as preventing trash from coming to the lake. Um, and uh, we have a kind of a, a, a part of that as well with our adopt a feeder stream program. I didn't mention it, but you can, you can choose to be an adopter of a, of a stream, you know, that's in the watershed somewhere. If you find one that uh, your group uh, is interested in, then you're taking trash out before it reaches the lake. Like the Haw River Assembly uh, does this every year. Once a year, they have a program and, and their volunteers go out to the Haw River uh, upstream of the lake and, and do cleanups. Uh, I know that's a long answer it's, and it's dancing around the, the real issue of how do you reduce waste uh, per se. But um, I, I really had hoped that we would do better at reaching back into counties with this. And we that's where we're trying to go with our messaging. Uh, but it's a, it's a challenge to, you know, find the right avenues to enter into um, a, a, a county government uh, with this kind of a message. Okay, I have another question for you. Um, Carol wants to know, what is the time interval for the lake level rise associated with the cleanup event? Well, I guess I, I could probably answer that as well as Laurel, but it, it varies all over the place. Uh, we don't have a regular schedule of going around the lake uh, like you might think of, uh, like we should progress counterclockwise through each of these sections. 
it depends on so many things that um, the frequency uh, with which we clean up a site varies tremendously. So to answer that question about how many, what's the time interval, it, it can be a year in a lot of cases. It can, it might be, or, or two years, uh, but it, it depends on a lot of things. I'll, I'll give you as one example, um, believe it or not, uh, an interference is the, uh, the fact that the Wildlife Resources Commission owns or manages uh, about 70% of the land around the lake. Now, we can't be there during hunting seasons. We're not, we're not allowed to be there, except on Sundays. But most groups that want to volunteer don't want to work on Sundays. So during those hunting seasons, like from September to December uh, for our deer, we can't be there. So then if we, you know, and so that would make almost a, you know, four month interval uh, between cleanups. But another factor is rainfall. Um, you know, once it rains heavily, then we got our work cut out everywhere and we have to kind of prioritize uh, where we want to go first and, and know that we are constrained by, let's say, hunting seasons as an example. So um, the, again, the long winded, sorry, <laughs> but there is multiple factors uh, in why I can't tell you the, the time interval. It, it's certainly not, um, it, you know, we wouldn't go back to the same site. Uh, unless there had been a rainfall, you know, once we've cleaned and we've done a good job and believe me, I've been out on most of these cleanups with, with the volunteers. So I know very much uh, what the, what's in front of them to walk along these shorelines uh, and, uh, uh, and know that it's clean. When I look back, it's clean. Uh, and so it won't be, it, it, it will take another rainfall. So that's another factor. Okay, I think we only have time for one more question. And so what I'm going to do for the other ones uh, for the other questions that I have, I'm going to copy and paste them and send them to uh, Professor Fran and Laurel and, um, and have them to answer them individually. So I'll make sure that your question gets answered. Um, I'll email those to you. Um, so the other question that we have um, is, do you have a scuba diving component to the cleanup activities? No, we don't. <laughs> Uh, we thought about that, um, but um, uh, we'd, we'd enjoy to have somebody volunteer. Uh, I would love to investigate the bottom of the lake, uh, but it does get flushed very, very easily. You know, with these huge storms, there is an enormous amount of flow. For example, in the Haw River, it gets flushed and may then end up um, closer to the dam, for example, uh, but it may move. I'd like to make one comment that's kind of technical. Um, about why we use lake level rise and cumulative lake level rise as metrics. Not every storm is the same intensity. So uh, by using lake level rise, we're accounting for that intensity factor, right? So uh, we got a small storm, but then the next one's a big one. So we get a high amount of water uh, lake level rise. And that when we normalize, you would have thought that we, we, we've accounted for everything to where we should get a flat line across those bar graphs that, that she showed, um, but we don't. And that's because there are spatial components to the way uh, uh, and wind components uh, that affect uh, why trash accumulates differently. Okay, well, I really hate to, maybe we have time to maybe do one more <laughs> question because I hate to cut it off. Give me I want one that Laura will answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me see what's the next one. Where's the trash disposed of and who pays for the collection of disposal of trash by each locality? I assume the tires are recycled. That's what I guess I have to answer that. That's not a total <laughs> scope of work. Uh, okay, uh, we have a, a, a wonderful arrangement. I should have given credit to the Chatham County because they provide us with a dumpster that they come and remove. We, we have to haul uh, from our sites. We have to ferry trash by boat and pontoon boat and unload it onto a dock where the dumpster sits and then that's hauled away. So that's for free. Uh, the tires, we do have a recycling uh, arrangement that we have to apply for through bridge, Bridgestone tires. And so they, they are recycled through the Bridgestone tire company uh, program. Otherwise we'd be paying about $4 a tire, which, and by the way, we have no paid staff and we have uh, relatively few resources. 
uh, and we depend on donations primarily to get this work done. So um, it, it, it is um, handled by Chatham County primarily uh, in our waste disposal. That's the answer as well as Bridgestone for tires. Okay, I um, really hated to cut off the question and answer. I have uh, a couple of questions, Laurel and Doc, uh, Professor Fran, that I'll send to you guys that we can so we can answer those individually. Um, I just definitely want to thank everyone again for joining us today and wanted to give you guys a heads up. Um, we do have another um, webinar right after this about the ARPA funding. Um, I'm sure you guys got notices uh, regarding that. So if you want to close out and tune into that, that will be greatly appreciated. But I definitely wanted to let you not, guys know we have our upcoming webinar next month, um, June the 15th. Um, Dr. Barbara Ball, uh, Barbara Dahl, I'm sorry, will be presenting. Uh, she will be speaking about evaluating the potential of natural uh, infrastructure to mitigate flooding in eastern North Carolina. So put that on your calendars. I'll definitely be sending you guys some marketing materials regarding that to register and sign up. I've put the link um, several times in the chat, so please copy and paste that for your um, PDH credit, and I will get those out to you as soon as possible. A big shout out to Dr. to Professor Fran and Laurel for your time. Thank you so very much for presenting, and um, it's just greatly appreciated. It looked like you were about to say something, uh, Professor Fran. I, I wanted to give credit also with regard to trash removal to uh, the bags, you may also ask, where do we get 20,000 bags? The Department of Transportation uh, has been gracious uh, to us and provides us with all of those bags. Just wanted to shout out to the DOT for that great help. Okay, and actually, um, Sammy actually gave you a shout out. He said his office upstream enjoys working with clean Jordan Lake <laughs> when he can. So he wanted to make that comment. So he or she, I'm sorry. <laughs> so anyways, um, I will give you guys eight minutes back into your day. Um, thank you so very much for tuning in to this webinar and um, we and your participation is greatly appreciated. And thank you so much. Um, again, uh, Professor Fran and Laurel, you guys have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you all. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.